In the spring of 1990, the Philadelphia Museum of Art had a show called Contemporary Philadelphia Artists, for which they printed a terrific catalog. On pages 122 and 123 were two painters named John. The John on the right, me, abandoned painting in 2007 in favor of making films about artists. The John on the left, John Opie, is now 79 years old. He has been so good for so long that I knew I had to make a movie about him. Getting a little long in the tooth myself, I needed to find out what has kept him creating at such a high level for over 60 years. Somehow, I'd never met him, despite seeing and loving his shows in the 1980s and 90s at Philadelphia's Moore Gallery. I hunted him down on Facebook and on October 19th, 2015, drove out to Pleasant Valley, Pennsylvania. My first glimpse of the legendary John Opie. Nice to meet you, John. <laughs> nice to meet you, John. Wow, it's beautiful where you live. Well, <laughs> we've got one more year here. Nice to meet you. <laughs> I ended up spending a lovely afternoon with John and his wife Susan as they were preparing to sell their home and move to Portland, Oregon to be near their three daughters. Do you want to go? I like painting because it's halfway between carpentry and philosophy. <laughs> philosophy is a kind of pretentious way of saying there are ideas involved in carpentry because it's a practical hands-on thing. You're making something. Not just making a stretcher and stretching the canvas and priming the plywood and all that, but the act of painting is kind of like carpentry. It's practical and problem-solving. It's physical. How would you characterize your art? I don't know. Painterly realism. Let the brush stroke show. Like I just looked at a bunch of old slides, and the ones that I like best generally are looser, freer, more spontaneous. It used to be important to me to try to be an original painter, and I don't care about that anymore. I just try to make a decent painting, a good painting. I asked Paul Georges, who was a friend of mine, what he liked of somebody's work, and he said, I look at paintings one at a time. That's a pretty good credo, and that's what I do. I think there's some sense of me in there. Something about the subject matter carries over the time of day or the period we live in. If it's a musician painting, the, the kind of music that guy makes, I hope that comes across. Or if it's a landscape, where that might be, what time of year it is. I saw in the Met years ago these sarcophagus portraits by Ptolemaic era painters, and I thought, well, there it all is. The artist is there. He's in the painting of that face, and the guy he represents is also there. And that's what the family wanted when they commissioned the portrait to go on the coffin lid. So that's how painting works. The artist is there, and the subject matter he's dealing with is also there. To continue on, hopefully, when the artist is no longer around. John's enormous love of jazz music has been a major source for paintings over the years. I started making pictures of jazz musicians when I was in high school and just never stopped.
some musicians have distinctive postures, you know, you want to try to get that. Bill Evans played hunched over often at a keyboard. One composition he wrote, Blue in Green. How did you come up with that pink? Often there's an orange glow inside the piano when the lid is open, and I just shifted it. Your color sense is so beautiful. Can you talk about color a little bit? No. <laughs> <laughs> it's all intuitive. I don't know or understand any color systems. All I know is that if you put in a warm color, you better put in a cool color near it. Slowly you learn a few things, put the lightest thing in the painting next to the darkest thing in the painting. That's more dramatic. Jelly Roll Morton by the great John Opie, now in the Morton sure. Collection. Let me make sure to sign it. This is Bill Charlotte playing in a club in Easton. He's become very prominent since then. Billy right. Strayhorn, yeah. What's your favorite jazz instrument? Tenor saxophone, piano. That's two. Which is your favorite? <laughs> I'm not going to pick one. <laughs> Israeli musician. Right? Yeah, he's really good. I saw him on YouTube. The color in the painting isn't anything like the YouTube color, but this is the blues singer Jimmy Rushing. He was short and wide. He was known as Mr. Five by Five. Stan Getz, bowing out. He had just died. It's cornet chop suey, so I chop sueyed the cornets. There's the chop suey symbols there. Chinese restaurant, Chinese writing. This is Phil Woods, a recently departed great alto saxophonist. And this was in a show that he attended, and he walked through, breezing by everything very quickly. When he got to this painting, I went up to him and I said, do you think it looks like you? And he said, yeah, he moved on. <laughs> That is Ben Webster. They used this photograph on the cover. I had changed the painting in the interim. It's based on Charles Mingus' composition, Goodbye Pork Pie Hat. Lester Young, the great saxophonist, wore a distinctive, designed and made especially for him, pork pie hat. So here's the pork pie hat in kind of a head shape, which is the bell of the saxophone on a stair step to heaven, I guess. <laughs> Goodbye, pork pie hat. Charlie Parker, seminal alto saxophonist on the left. De Kooning on the right. De Kooning had a chair like that. And he had striped pants like that. And I painted a little paint splatters on his shoes. And there's a painting here you can make out. A painting of a saxophonist sitting next to De Kooning. That kind of blends in with all the drawing. The music and painting kind of merging here into a single thing. Louis Armstrong and Bessie Smith in my living room. In art, all things are possible. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> The New Orleans Museum of Art owns a wonderful Opie painting of the painter Edward Vuillard with jazz man Bix Beiderbecke. I asked John about his painter-musician combos. He wrote to me, It was kind of a parlor or barroom game with artists of my generation who also were interested in jazz. Name a painter who is comparable or sympathetic with. Name a musician. I believe that Louis Armstrong is America's Picasso. Pairing juicy abstract expressionist Bill de Kooning with bebopper Bird Parker goes without explanation. Beckman was paired with Thelonious Monk, both making a kind of tough beauty. Matisse's and Ellington's art is so very elegant, suave, and original. When I started out, I hoped to be as good as Cezanne, but in time I realized I'd be plenty lucky if I was as good as Raoul Dufy. I don't think Stefan Grappelli ranks up there with Louis Armstrong or Ellington, but there's plenty to enjoy and admire, and he and Dufy had distinctive original voices. If Beckman and Monk were tough, Dufy and Grappelli were more easy, more charming.
great day in Harlem, they invited the jazz musicians who were in town to show up on the footsteps of a brownstone in a black neighborhood. Duke Ellington was out of town. But these are really the greats. That's, that's Mingus right there. That pork pie hat, that's not a... That's Lester Young with his oh, pork pie God. hat. So they did one in Pittsburgh. There's my son in Pittsburgh. Ben is a musician who plays saxophone and other instruments and teaches at Carnegie Mellon. He wrote out some music for his dad. The uh, opening notes of West End Blues, one of the great Louis Armstrong recordings, he said later, oh, I made a mistake in that. <laughs> All four of the Opie's children went into the arts. Their three daughters are visual artists living in Oregon. What did your dad do? He had a little uh, manufacturing company. They sold art supplies, among other things. It was called the OP, O hyphen P, Craft Company. And they made finger joint basswood boxes that a consumer would decorate or paint or carve. And they sold these things by mail order, by way of catalogs. So he was uh, very practical. Were you a kid artist? Yes, I was. I always liked to draw. Was there any doubt as you got older that that's what you wanted to do with your life? <laughs> Naively, no. I never looked back. <laughs> George William Albert Koch. He died in 1947, and I was 10 at the time he died. I grew up with this painting. This painting was always in the house. So it really kind of affected you, I guess. Yeah, I think so. Our families always did Thanksgiving together. Did you ever get painting lessons from him? Or? Nothing like that. I was too young. He had a tonalist period that was interesting. He was like an early industrial landscape. Nice painting. Beautiful, actually. Huh. Had no career. This is about this big, this next one. Lovely. Oh, yeah. Why wouldn't he be better known? You know, living in Sandusky, Ohio, how do you have a career in the 40s? I would say this about career things. If it's a struggle to give your work to museums, then your career <laughs> has not been a great success. I've been waiting and waiting for this museum in Louisiana to accept this painting. So this is the Hart Theater in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, no longer extant. I have a single figure here uh, watching the movie. And it says it's a little bit after two o'clock in the afternoon. A movie critic's wife from Houston saw a version of this and said, oh, that's how I, my husband sees movies, by himself in the middle of the afternoon. <laughs> a lot of your paintings are of other creative people, artists, musicians. Do you have a, a certain feeling about what the creative life is all about or its importance? Yeah, I suppose. No, I hope it matters, the things we make. I try to make them good enough so that they matter. What is your ego like? You don't seem to have be bothered by much. <laughs> I think that's right. <laughs> try not to be. Every now and then something bothers me. The first paintings that I remember seeing of yours were people swimming at night in a pool with the, the pool lights on. Was that done from reality? Did you have a pool? Didn't have a pool. Went to a party at a neighbor's house and it got after dark and they turned the pool lights on and people went in the pool. And I said, oh boy, I gotta do that. This peculiar illumination where the part of the body that's in the water is lit up in the part of the body that's out of the water. It has a totally different, darker tonality. I went over there with the kids and some high-speed ectochrome and I took slides so I could see what the water looked like. The underwater parts, you got to be really kind of loose and painterly and then more straight painting for the above water parts. And so the paintings were half based on slides, images, and half made up. Your imaginative powers are almost always evident in your work. You don't paint strictly realism. 
A no. lot of it seems to be out of your imagination, right? Yeah, well, I came out of college during the period of abstract expressionism, and you made up paintings. You started with a blank canvas and no photographs and no model. You just made something up. That was the tradition I got started in. As time went on, I thought that the invention of shapes was more interesting if they were based on real objects. So increasingly, the abstract forms in the paintings became recognizable, but in peculiar arrangements and juxtapositions. So I would sit with a Sears catalog and, and to get ideas for things to put together in paintings. Suspenders, belts, two kinds of fur hat, a felt hat, a blanket or something. And here's, I see there's a woman's figure behind him. So there are two figures that are kind of merging. And then she's on his necktie. This says Harris Tweed down here. So I just copied a Harris Tweed label of something. And then there are these abstract forms that are kind of intertwined. And geometric shapes floating. I'm, I always like this mixture of geometry and uh, more natural forms. Do you know the painter R.B. Katai? Oh yeah, sure. Yeah, he was pretty good at that. He was from Cleveland. Yeah. So I'm from 60 miles west of there. Cuyahoga. Uh, Sandusky. Sandusky. That's where the buzzards come home to roost, right? No, that's in... Uh, <laughs> that's, <laughs> no, I don't think so. Sneaker mojo. The sneaker is a source of some kind of energy or power. Rhinoplasty. Nose job. <laughs> Here's a hammer with a nose on it. What made you want to do that? You didn't have a nose job, did you? I did not. <laughs> and then I made prints, too. This is an etching and aquatint. Talking at Harry's. This off-color conversation that goes on among young males. And this is the dark of the night here. Baseball glove. Various kinds of distorted figures. Two elements from an oriental rug. Abstract sculptural devices. I was certainly influenced by Sioux sculpture when I was doing those things. Were you married right out of art school? Fairly soon, yeah. And you've been married for how long? Over 50 years. I don't remember. Plane hitting a mountain. By Sue Opie. All right, this is a difficult question with him lurking in the background, okay. but has he been a good husband? Oh, of course he has. <laughs> this winter it will be 53, 53 years or 54. I never know. Wow. I just know it's more than 50. <laughs> <laughs> Our 50th wedding anniversary came and went Nobody remembered, including us, huh? and the children didn't remember. I mean, we don't make a fuss over those things. She did these creatures and things emerging from, from pies. <laughs> she started out doing self-portraits of herself seated in a pie, and it, it developed on from that. So here's a gorilla pie. Here's a, a gorilla coming out of a pie. It's, it's, I guess that's a baby gorilla. Sue had her foundry here for, she didn't want to melt the metal, which you pour it around 2,000 degrees Fahrenheit. She didn't want to do that in an old barn. So we had this one small cement block building built. And so we had pouring apparatus in there. So all these things like this frog and uh, grouse, I guess that is, were cast here. You cast them in pieces and then assemble them. Here's a lizard and here's where it's, it's being attached with a weld. Wow. When she grinds down the welds and make the surface match. So these bases were 
cast of the Johnson Atelier. They sand cast them. But this was entirely cast here in that figure and that figure. And, and Sue made this entirely here in pieces. You know, you weld them together. What's it been like being married to a fellow artist for half a century? Oh, we stay out of each other's hair. <laughs> My joke is uh, I ask for Sue's advice as to what I should do on a painting. And I give her advice on her sculpture, which she ignores. <laughs> you take her advice? Oh, yeah, sure. <laughs> One of my methods is to paint changes on saran wrap. Put saran wrap over the painting, make a variation, see if you liked it better. So I would call in Sue and say, what do you like better, this? Pull the saran wrap off, or this? <laughs> this is not working. Is it true that you solicit his advice and then ignore it? I think that would be accurate. <laughs> <laughs> no, but she doesn't solicit it. I give it to her, give I it solicit to her. <laughs> Then I solicit her advice. And he takes it, he said. <laughs> we could argue a few points there, but uh, we, we don't discuss a whole lot between us anyway. Uh, I listen to him. I think John and Sue Opie clearly have a great marriage, both body and soul. They know when to listen and when to tune out each other's flights of fancy. And at least I'm pretty sure that John's series of nudes doing housework are not based on their actual domestic life. The hard thing for me to make up is the room. So I'll, I'll get the room idea from a decorator magazine, you know, like Architectural Digest or something like that. I work both in acrylic and in oil. I work sitting down on small paintings in acrylic, and usually I work standing up out in the barn studio in oil on bigger things. The medium is a half and half mixture of liquid and stand oil medium. The liquid speeds up the drying time so that the next day the surface isn't like glue, the brush isn't glued to the canvas. The stand oil medium is stand oil, turpentine, and Damar varnish. An attractive way to thin the paint down. And I do a lot of thin stuff that way. A lot of washes or glazes in the medium. Keep it in a squeeze bottle, squeeze it out on the palette. Oh, so all your medium is in that suave shampoo bottle? Yes. <laughs> Sue doesn't accidentally rinse her hair with us, I hope. No. <laughs> The imaginative element in your work, as an example, that series you did of Mount Rushmore. You mean Elvis Presley heads is as if they were a Mount Rushmore? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was doing paintings that had a widely disparate scale, like in Egyptian art. The pharaoh is 10 feet tall and the slave is a foot tall. I thought it was an enlivening pictorial device. So I was looking for things to do that with. <laughs> That's what I was looking at, photographs of Borglund, I guess his name was, uh, carving Mount Rushmore. This is above the Valley of the King. <laughs> Here's another one. We have a sacrificial offering here in front of the statue of Elvis. Do you see the paintings in your head before they're done? How do you plan the design, or does it change on the canvas? Most of the larger paintings were preceded by something smaller, so I have some idea where I'm going. The great challenge is to make the bigger painting as good as the little one. You know, because if you like a little one well enough to blow it up, to make a bigger version, it's got something. Getting something anew in a bigger painting is not an easy thing to do, and it's, it's a real mystery as to how you get there, uh, to me. And sometimes you don't get there. Do I have an idea? 
I have an idea, but that tends to not work out to be what I thought it was going to be. It's going to be something else. <laughs> Late Cat is a giant. <laughs> I love the freedom in John's work and that he puts no limits on himself in coming up with his imagery. He is perfectly happy to work directly from real life or use photographs or simply invent something out of his imagination. The setting is based on a photograph I found online. There were figures in a boat, but they were two cops standing up in blue raincoats. I didn't want that. <laughs> so I made it a couple out fishing. This may date it, the backwards baseball cap. Who are the people? These are all totally invented. Similar kind of aura. The women sitting around chatting. It's been a while to think of this. The edge of the glass table. That was invented. I love this theme in John's work of people just quietly being with one another. Can you talk about light? Because you use light in a really interesting way, be it the pool paintings or the under lighting of Elvis or in car lights at night. I think my observation was if you could get that, then it gave the painting a place in time. It gave it a moment, a sense of moment. If you could get some kind of light effect that resonated. When you went to art school, was realism considered something that dopes did? Well, I didn't feel that way, but some people did. I went through with people who admired Edward Hopper and Walter Murch. I mean, we liked all that stuff. Love Mirandi, still do. There was a Mirandi in a Carnegie International, it was $900. <laughs> That's how much he got for a painting then. Did you buy it? No, you couldn't get your hands on them. Somebody else got to them first. <laughs> I shook Edwin Dickinson's hand one time. He was hanging a show in the Graham Gallery in New York City. They say that de Kooning went in to see a Dickinson show and was really wild that he was doing this things he was doing as early as he was doing them. Very painterly. And I love Winslow Homer's watercolors. Giotto, uh, Sassetta, uh, Sienese painter. I'm not a fan of Picasso. Some Matisse's, you know, I really like. And I like Max Beckman quite a bit. So this is the end of Max Beckman. He's outside the Museum of Natural History. He was walking in Central Park when he had a fatal heart attack and died. He'd worked on a painting the night before. Here's a little black plane up here, the Angel of Death. Giant Spirit of Aikens. Now you like Aikens, but you weren't particularly influenced by him, are you? That's correct. Yeah, every time you drive down Kelly Drive and you see the skull boats out there, you, get, you, you have to think of Aikens. I've looked pretty closely at Fairfield Porter. This is Porter. He would use a wheelbarrow, he'd wheel it out wherever it was he went in the summertime, some island up in New England, and he would then sit in it to paint. So I have him painting Jane Freilecker. Who's Jack Wilkinson? When we were at LSU, he'd 
became department chairman, the best boss I, I ever had. He was the teacher of Paul George's and Kenneth Snelson. He was some movie makers, Merchant Ivory. He was James Ivory's teacher at the University of Oregon in Eugene. But we know him in Louisiana. This is John Clem Clark. And he was friends with you, right? Yeah, mm -hmm. neighbors. I really struggle with likenesses, and I had this representation of the painter Paul George's in a painting, and I didn't like where it was positioned, and I decided I had to move it. I photographed it to help me get back to it again, moving the figure elsewhere. What's up with Paul George's? He died 10 years ago. And he was a pretty good friend of yours? At a certain arm's length. I liked him, but he was a really forceful personality. And you had a certain affinity, aesthetically speaking. Your work kind of relates to his. In, Somewhat, yeah, yeah. yeah. He was having lunch with his wife and a friend in a restaurant right on the Atlantic in Normandy, where he lived. His uh, wife told me this. He said, um, I'm tired. I think I'll have a nap after lunch. And he fell over, and he was dead. It's probably not a bad way to go. Lucky way to go. <laughs> But I would look now more at Bonard and Vuillard than anybody else, probably. And I'm just perfectly comfortable of being influenced by them. John told me that Pierre Bonard opened up avenues of color that no artist has yet to truly explore. John painted a series of portraits of Bonard as a giant. The Bonard Appears paintings. I remember that series, too. There were three... A green one, a yellow one, and I don't have a digital photo of the red one, which is in a museum in Louisiana. I gave it to them. There's a quote from Bonard. I shall appear before the young painters of the 21st century with wings of butterflies. And here I have the butterflies coming off his palette. Oh, my and this is set at a painting studio on the Tyler campus. Where they had that big slanted window and they used these kind of easels. I went there and took some Polaroids to get an idea for a setting. So here's the same room. Is Bonard just about your favorite artist? I suppose, yes. Uh -huh. What was your dog's name? Bugsy. Just like Bonard painted his docks in a lot, Bugsy seems to be in a lot of these paintings. Yeah. <laughs> Bugsy used to hang out with me out here. House, car, dog, fall. <laughs> 4-H rabbits at the Agricultural Hall in Allentown. Testa Rosa. Everybody called him Testa. And Sue would ride him around? Yeah, except by the time she got him, he was in kind of bad shape, so <laughs> he was more of a pet. Carnival balloon guy. Dart game. You know, they have these blow-up carnival attractions. Yeah. This one is a blow-up Titanic. The kids climb up here and then they slide down. <laughs> Made up all the country fair stuff in the background. I did several of these views of the backside of a carnival because I like the way these things were like big abstract sculptures. I'm constantly on the lookout for good role models, and I think I finally understand the secrets to John Opie's terrific, and I might add successful, life and art. So listen up, fellow seekers. It's not because he is excessively tidy. Well, I have to say that like myself, you may not be getting any award for being the neatest person. <laughs> John, this is <laughs> oh. <laughs> But there are a few character traits we of a creative bent would be wise to emulate. He is very patient and often hits for singles rather than always swinging for the fences.
He doesn't take himself too seriously and can laugh at whatever is outside his control. Wait, who did that painting? John Opie, British and, painter. He's known as the Cornish Wonder. And you allege that he died in 1840? 1814, something like that. But some people think that you actually are the same artist. <laughs> no, nobody's confusing us. And when you put my name in Google, that's what you're going to get. <laughs> Hopefully my movie will change that. He hooked up with a terrific partner and never let go. Don't take me, like <laughs> dancing. Missy, dancing. There we go, we're dancing. Very nice, yes. Finally, he is exceptionally open-minded and he just keeps working doing his best year after year. When was this done? 1956. How did you get to the point where you knew how to simplify the form and get just enough without going crazy in detail? <laughs> you know, it's trial and error. It's like the movie Groundhog Day. You just gotta keep doing it over and over until you get it right. This is my abacus for counting laps when I go. Every one of these is a fifth of a mile. So that's a mile, two miles, three miles. How far do you jog? Five, five miles. Really? One, two, three, four, five. How often? Three times a week. You, do, you jog five miles three times a week? Yeah, I'm slow. His last two series before leaving for Oregon speak to his refusal to limit himself aesthetically. These still lives were done from direct observation. And then there are these peculiar landscapes. An intentional effort to go back to a more improvised painting, bordering on abstraction, and they're Oh. There's, there are paintings of the wild vines that grow around here. I wanted a subject that would allow me to draw freely. I had photographs of vines I was looking at, but they were largely improvised. extraordinarily nice to, to meet you after all these years. Thank you. It's, it's been a pleasure. Uh, thank you. I wish you lived next door. We yeah, a, no, we but... have a good time. Yeah. <laughs> oh, what a lucky guy I am to have spent that beautiful afternoon with the Opies and speaking for every artist I know who saw your work in your Philly days. Thank you, John, for the charm and pleasure that you have brought into our lives. <laughs>